Hello, this is Ronnie Neff again, and this is Section B of the um, Farm Bill and Public Health talk. And in the prior section, I described some of the history and the context for the Farm Bill. In this one, I turn to what is in the Farm Bill, and this is the brand new 2014 Farm Bill. But it also gives you a broader sense of what generally is in Farm Bills and how that, most importantly, how that connects to public health. And um, I think that this is important not only for thinking about the Farm Bill, but for thinking conceptually about what kinds of policies we might consider to address um, public health issues related, related to the food system. So here's the brief overview. This is a $956 billion bill, 959 pages, so it's almost a billion dollars a page. And this nearly trillion dollar estimate um, is estimated over 10 years, although actually, as I mentioned earlier, farm bills typically last only about five years. So here are the 12 titles, and this gives you a sense for the content of what's in the farm bill, a brief overview. And the ones in red are the ones I'm going to talk about here. Commodities, conservation, nutrition, research extension and related matters, horticulture, and crop insurance. Just to give you a visual sense of how all this lays out, um, here is farm bill spending by title. And you can see that nearly 80% of the farm bill is the nutrition title, and the vast majority of that is SNAP, or formerly food stamps. Um, the second largest piece is now crop insurance, which was not the case in prior farm bills. And then comes conservation and commodities. And then comes everything else, and that little $8 billion sliver of everything else is actually quite important when it comes to public health because a lot of the programs that are particularly public health oriented and that, that promote health are relatively small and yet a, a small program of something like say $100 million, which is not a lot in the context of the Farm Bill, can make a tremendous difference when it comes to um, promoting public health and, and injecting that kind of money into a local or regional food system or, or, or a, a health program, some of the programs are only as much as $5 million and they can still make a big difference. Here's a brief summary of the major ways in which this farm bill is different from prior ones. First thing is that it cut $23 billion, again with that 10 year time horizon. Um, and that $23 billion includes the money that's cut out of the Farm Bill and across most government programs through the sequester, which I'll discuss in Part C. Um, and when you look at how that breaks down, the three major programs where there were cuts, um, $8.5 billion were cut out of the SNAP program. And that was a compromise. The House was pushing for a $40 billion cut, and the Senate had been pushing for a $4 billion cut. I wouldn't say that eight and a half billion dollars really made anybody happy, but it was the compromise that was reached. Conservation um, was cut by six billion dollars. That's less than these other two types of programs. Proportionally, however, it's it's a bit a steeper cut to conservation programs. And then farm program payments um, received a nineteen billion dollar cut. So that's that's quite substantial, and I'll talk about how that played out. Primarily what this meant was ending the direct and counter-cyclical payment subsidies. And this is when people talk about subsidies in the Farm Bill, this is really what they are referring to typically, especially the direct payments. Those are ended now. Um, we've replaced that with a different kind of safety net, which is um, support for people to buy crop insurance. And I'll talk a lot about what, how, what that looks like. And then in this Farm Bill, there were also increases in a number of programs related to healthy food, related to local and regional food production, and organics. So I want to return to the framework that I presented in the first talk, because first part of this talk, because this is how I'm going to organize all the pieces of discussing what's in the Farm Bill based on this five-point framework of why the Farm Bill is a public health bill. Food security, what we eat, environmental sustainability and environmental health, equity, and rural income and quality of life. So let me start with food security. And there's two reasons why I start with food security. One is the, as I had shown, 
80% of the Farm Bill is about food security, is SNAP. And this is a program that serves a large number of people. It's the largest um, food safety net program that we have. It serves 47 million people a month. Um, nearly half of them are children and almost 10% are seniors. And the other major reason why food insecurity comes to the top of the list is because of the substantial health impacts of food insecurity. So this is a public health issue, even though typically in talking about food and agriculture policy, we segment our discussion of food security from our discussion of public health. I would really argue for that to be completely unified because here are some of the public health impacts, physical and mental health impacts of food insecurity. For adults, diabetes, heart disease, depression, and anxiety, and for children, asthma, cognitive impairment, and behavioral problems. And the list goes on from here. And the impacts can be quite substantial. So SNAP, when you have SNAP, depending on which study you look at, there's suggestion that it reduces levels of food insecurity by 18 to 30 percent. So it's really an important program, regardless of what people eat when they use their SNAP money, even if they're eating relatively unhealthy food. If it's at least addressing some of these issues to some extent, that's really important. SNAP also has a big impact on economies. If you think of injecting all of those SNAP benefits into a local economy based on people spending that money in stores, uh, that's, that's significant. That affects jobs and that affects taxes. So um, cities and others are affected. And when economies and jobs are affected, that also plays out in terms of health. So just a little background, um, SNAP spending has risen dramatically in recent years, and a lot of that has to do with the recession. It also has to do with the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, which gave a bump in SNAP dollars. And that ended in the end of, near, near the end of 2012. And so it wasn't actually a cut to SNAP, but it was basically reverting back to where we had been. But it was substantial, it had a substantial impact. For a household of three, they would be reduce their benefits by $29 a month. And the end result is that now we are at something like, on average, about $1.40 per person per meal through SNAP benefits. And this depends on household size and it depends on income as well. So in the 2014 Farm Bill, as I mentioned, there was an $8.5 billion cut. And this plays out mainly through administrative change. It cuts about $90 a month for 850,000 people. So people aren't um, removed from their benefits, but um, a $90 a month cut is very meaningful when you're only getting the equivalent of about $1.40 per person per meal. Some of the other things that this recent Farm Bill did with SNAP are that it prohibited government-sponsored SNAP outreach. And SNAP outreach is a really important way of letting people know that they're eligible um, and encouraging them to sign up and access the safety net to which they're entitled. There was also a $200 million increase for emergency food, which is great, except when you think about it, basically what we're doing is we're cutting the safety net, and then we are putting a little increase on the safety net below the safety net. Within the SNAP program, there were several initiatives that could promote healthy foods within this farm bill. One of them, is it's very interesting, they basically said if you are a store and you accept SNAP benefits, then you have to stock a certain level of healthy and fresh foods. Um, and there had been a lower threshold, and now they've increased the threshold for that. And what that does is, if you think about food access in low-income communities, by requiring these healthy foods to be in small stores, corner stores, um, even gas stations, um, if they're going to accept SNAP, you're basically making more of these foods available in low-income communities. So that can have a significant impact. Another piece, and, and this is an administrative change, it doesn't actually cost the government anything. And in a time of tight budgets, it's really important to be thinking about administrative changes like these that we can make that can have an impact. Another program was the Food Insecurity Nutrition Initiative. This is a brand new program, and it's an incentive for SNAP recipients to buy produce or healthy foods um, by giving them matching dollars at the point of purchase. And this had been discussed in terms of it, it being a farmer's market program, and that's where this kind of program partly got its start. Um, but this could also be used in other areas as well, it, and it's not clear exactly how the rules for this are going to be written. 
This also relates to an initiative that was in the last Farm Bill that was a pilot project for supermarkets providing such incentives. Um, SNAP education, which is SNAP Ed, which is SNAP Ed, which provides nutrition education, was fully funded. And there was an interesting, another administrative change that can make a real difference was essentially allowing SNAP benefits to be used for purchasing food when you haven't actually received the food yet. And this played out in three different ways. One is that you can now deliver food. You can order online and deliver food, such as delivery into um, low food access areas. Um, it allows um, SNAP benefits to be used for food delivery to those who are homebound or disabled. And people can use their SNAP benefits to purchase community-supported agriculture shares. Food insecurity in a different way when we think of our international food aid programs, which reach at least 65 million people around the world a year. So traditionally, by law, almost all the food had come from U.S. agriculture and U.S. shipping. So this was developed in part, in substantial part, as a program to provide an outlet for these um, excess uh, goods that were produced. The challenge of that, first of all, w when we send that food overseas, we would give it away at low cost or no cost. And so when local farmers are trying to make a living, they're having a tough time competing against these imported foods. The, the word for that is called dumping. So this damages the ability of local food production to supply the food needs of an area, which is really what we're hoping um, that areas can develop their own self-sufficiency. That's what they want as well. Um, but the other problem with this is that it's environmentally unsound and it's very inefficient. It takes a long time to get those shipments where they need to go. In the last Farm Bill, there was a small initiative to, spend, to send money overseas to purchase food locally. And there was a tremendous increase in that for this Farm Bill. At the same time, so it'll assist 1.8 million more people by having this extra food and reducing this inefficiency. It could have been higher, but it's, it's a substantial increase. So let me turn now to the Farm Bill and how it affects what we eat. And for many in public health, this is one of the first things that we think about when we think about the Farm Bill. And there's a lot of discussion about the fact that, for example, my plate looks like the image on the left, and what we're eating looks like, for many of us, the, images, the image on the right. And the, the food and farm policy that we are supporting in this country isn't matching up with the type of recommendations that we're making for people. And at the same time, we've documented costs of fresh fruits and vegetables rising over time, while um, foods that use um, sugars and that use um, oils have often dropped in price over time. And so when we look at what's the culprit for this, why is this happening, many people will turn to commodity subsidies, as I was suggesting earlier. So in this last Farm Bill, we ended the commodity subsidies, all of those. So we, but we still have commodity subsidies. And here's a list of some of the many ways that we still continue to subsidize commodity production. Crop insurance, which I'm gonna spend some time describing. We provide credit, disaster assistance, marketing, and trade assistance. It's also important to recognize that the environmental subsidies that we provide, which I'll discuss a little farther along, are also substantially going to support commodities. And there are still some supply management policies in place. So why do we support commodity crops at all? Well, the main reason is basically that this is a safety net and it keeps the farmers farming. And we need that both because they provide us with our food and also because this is a significant support to rural economies. And because farming is a, a relatively good land use compared to development on that farmland. And why do we need this safety net? Well, basically, um, farmers have not been able to command the prices that they need to make a living. And so um, crops for the past number of years have been sold below the cost of production. Why is this the case? Well. Partly it has to do with the removal of those supply management mechanisms that I had mentioned um, earlier. In addition, um, the power of agribusiness has grown and it has enabled them to demand certain prices. And because we have a safety net that does enable farmers to stay in business, they've been able to demand these very low prices. 
So one of the key questions we hear all the time, do subsidies drive obesity? Most people in public health assume the answer is yes. The same arguments, I'm sure, are going to be made about what we've replaced those subsidies with, like the crop insurance and other commodity supports. And so the argument is typically it is typically made just based on um, intuition. Of course, subsidies drive obesity because we're subsidizing crops that we don't want people to eat, and those are going to processed foods, and the prices of processed foods are therefore lower than those for fruits and vegetables, so subsidies are driving obesity. So here's what the evidence actually suggests. Subsidies do play some role in what is planted. Not They don't entirely drive it, but they play some role in it. Um, and Basically, when you have um, overproduction and when you have low prices, that the subsidies are not causing the low prices, as I described just now, but they are in some ways a band-aid placed because we have low prices. So, but because nonetheless we have this band-aid, um, some certain foods cost less, and that's an incentive to use those ingredients. So manufacturers have an incentive to market foods that they have produced more cheaply um, and to place their marketing resources more towards those foods. So some of the probable impacts of subsidies on obesity, they probably have something to do with the ubiquity of processed food in this country. Again, they're not the underlying cause, but they may have something to do with it. They affect marketing um, of these foods. And then because they have enabled um, certain processed food industries and agribusiness to gain significant profit more than they would have otherwise, it may have contributed to some of the power in the food industry. And that power in the food industry in turn has contributed in various ways to shaping the type of food system that we have. So let's look at the flip side of this. This is really counterintuitive, but when you look at the evidence, there's been a lot of empirical research, and I was pretty skeptical of this when I first started looking into this. After having read this literature, I am convinced that the impact is likely very low, if at all. So when you look at the obesity trajectory in countries with all different subsidy structures, you generally see basically the same trajectory. So that's one piece of evidence suggesting that, um, that the subsidies aren't the factor that's driving the obesity. When you think about why this might be, so the farm price, especially for processed foods, is going to have a very minimal impact on the actual food price that you experience in this store. Let's say, for example, two to four cents on the dollar. So that low impact, if you have the total farm price is two to four cents on the dollar, if you have even a fraction of that that shifts up or down related to um, the way that we, that related to our commodity policy, it's not going to have that big of an impact on the food price that we as consumers experience. And for a lot of people, um, based on evidence about the price elasticity of demand or the extent to which uh, what we buy changes based on what the cost is, food price has a relatively minimal impact on purchasing many of the, especially many of the relatively unhealthy foods. And many people in the household may not even know what these foods cost because there may be one shopper who's, who's buying the foods and everybody else is just eating what's been purchased. So let me turn to the crop insurance. And just as a reminder here, this is now the second largest program within the Farm Bill. The way this works, it's an insurance policy so that if something goes wrong and a farmer is not able to earn the income that's expected from their crops, they will the insurance will pay out. The government pays 62% of a farmer's premium and there's 18 different insurance companies. So we've placed a lot of our resources here and traditionally one challenge has been that it's been harder to get crop insurance if you're producing in more sustainable farms, if you're producing um, like organically, if you've got a diversified farm with a lot of different types of, of produce being produced, or even, even so for fruits and vegetables. And part of the reason is because in order to make a good insurance policy, you need good actuarial data on what, uh, what yield might be expected in this area for this crop. And we haven't had that good data. But the, the new farm bill does have some um, efforts to increase access to crop insurance for sustainable and organic farms. 
Now I'm going to turn to how the Farm Bill can be used to promote healthy diets as well as diets that include more local and regional foods. And to, so I'll start out with health. And the first thing to understand is that our food supply does not allow us to have enough food if everybody wanted to eat according to the dietary guidelines. And a lot of people will point to this and say we need a farm bill that that shifts what is produced to match the dietary guidelines. Well that would be great except if we don't have the demand for eating those foods then you're going to have a lot of farmers going bankrupt. So we need at the same time as we're pushing for supply we need initiatives to build demand. And in fact the number one way to increase fruit and vegetable production is to build demand. But other ways to increase fruit and vegetable production um, within the Farm Bill in addition to possible programs to build demand research. So uh, a number of studies have found that the reason that prices for commodity crops have come down over the years has been the investment of research in research more than anything else. And research is a key way to identify methods for improving efficiency and yield and so there's a great need for funding and research and in fact this farm bill does have a lot of fun uh, an increase in funding for um, producing what's known as specialty crops or fruits and vegetables. You need more access to insurance and loans as I was discussing. Um, marketing and value-added opportunities. There are other types of programs which I'm not going to discuss right now but we can discuss them in the BBS if you're interested. So what's in the Farm Bill actually to promote healthy foods and food access? Probably the largest increase in funding in this area is specialty crop block grants. That is a tongue twister. You should try and say it five times. And these block grants are vary by state in terms of how they're actually implemented and what they're used for. But some states have used them to promote healthy food and to promote um, local and regional production and there's lots of opportunity to push for those kinds of uses. The Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Snack Program delivers snacks to students in schools. Healthy Food Financing Initiative is an initiative that um, has been used to bring financing to bring supermarkets and other retailers into low-income areas. And um, there's funding for that, and I already mentioned the SNAP retailer stocking criteria. So there are um, initiatives to promote local and regional production as well. I already mentioned the Food Insecurity Nutrition Incentive Program, which could be used for farmers markets. There's also incentives for seniors to purchase um, farmer food at the farmers market. The Farmers Market and Local Food Promotion Program is really important in terms of help providing funds to help build that sector, both for direct marketing, which includes farmers markets, as well as for building the much needed infrastructure for processing, distributing, and aggregating and storing those local and regional foods. And there are other initiatives as well. So let me turn now to environmental sustainability and environmental health. And of course, environmental sustainability plays a major role in contributing to long-term food security. So why is promoting these environmental goals a public health issue? Well, because, first of all, of the long-term food security, but also there's impacts on um, nutrient pollution, as you, you've probably heard some of these in the other lectures for this course, water and soil impacts, the impacts of CAFOs, and then finally, the various impacts of an unsustainable food system that are going to play out in all kinds of as yet unpredicted ways on public health, whether it's through climate change and impacts on heat stress and floods and droughts and so on. So commodity, I'm going to start in this section rather than talking about the conservation programs, I'm going to start talking about some of the negative impacts on the farm bill. So our commodity policy really does push over production and when they talk about the Gulf of Mexico dead zone each year, a lot of that has to do with the very high use of fertilizer throughout the, um, the Midwest where they're producing commodities and because of that high use, you get runoff down the Mississippi River and right into the Gulf of Mexico. So that could be said to be directly attributable to farm policy. Our farm policy also provides an indirect subsidy to meat production, industrial meat production. And 
there's not that much within the Farm Bill that directly subsidizes meat production. But when you think about the fact that our commodity policy is enabling these feed grains to be sold below the cost of production, it's, according to this one analysis, a $35 billion subsidy, indirect subsidy, and much of that goes to large firms. So I want to talk about conservation compliance. This is another piece of commodity policy that can have a major environmental impact. And what conservation compliance is, is it says that if you are farming on environmentally sensitive land, then you have to meet certain minimal standards of environmental protection. So it's important to link to crop insurance because essentially when you have crop insurance, you're saying if a disaster happens, we will reimburse you. So you want people to, at the same time, be doing everything that they can to prevent that disaster from happening. And that means good environmental stewardship. And the USDA, to, to suggest some of the impact of conservation compliance, USDA documented a 40% decline in soil erosion over 15 years and attributed at least a quarter of that to conservation compliance provisions. Now the challenge in conservation compliance is that um, farms get to certify themselves and there's little money available for enforcement. And so, so the, the level of improvement that we may get may be a little questionable. So now let me turn to the conservation programs. And the, there, are, there are three main ones that I'll talk about. And these have generally had many more applicants than there is money. And in this Farm Bill, we had the fir first reduction in conservation funding since these programs were started back in 1985. Um, and so that's a, a real problem, given the ever-increasing demand and also the ever-increasing need as our um, need for intervention to promote a more environmentally sustainable food system just continues to grow with situations like drought and um, heat stress and pests and so on related to climate change and other environmental threats. So let me describe these three main conservation programs. The first one is the Conservation Reserve Program. Basically what it does is it takes land out of production and gives farmers some money to put on a conservation cover to help that land to recover itself and to create um, uh, healthy soils, biodiversity, and so on. A lot of acres are going to expire out of these conservation programs in the upcoming years, so there's a real need to ensure a good transition out or to hopefully get some of these lands to re-enroll. Conservation Stewardship Program and EQIP, both by contrast, are called Working Lands Conservation Programs, and these are conservation programs on active farms. The Conservation Stewardship Program focuses on um, systemic types of interventions that, um, that may address multiple problems or multiple strategies at once, for example, to improve soil, whereas EQIP is focused on specific activities that you might do on your working land. Um, both very effective, but a challenge with EQIP is that 60% um, of EQIP dollars have been set aside for livestock. And what that has often meant is that we are essentially giving conservation dollars so that they, they say, well, we're going to grow bigger, so we need a bigger manure cesspit. And so we're basically enabling the increased size of IFAP facilities. At the same time, the EQIP funding also has funds set aside for organic production. And so that's that's been seen as a positive thing, and that was... Um, again in this new farm bill that's still there. There are also several specific programs for organic production. One of the big ones is that um, going back to the crop insurance, um, traditionally if you had organic crops you had to insure them at the price, you would get the price of conventional crops and now the new farm bill recognizes that organics actually um, should get a higher price because that's how the market for organics works. And there are a number of other programs within the Farm Bill that support organic production. So let me turn now to the fourth area, and I'm going to spend a little less time on this fourth and fifth area, but the Farm Bill has a number of provisions related to equity. Equity is a public health issue because there have been, uh, there's a lot of evidence that economic inequality contributes to numerous health outcomes, and because a lot of these equity provisions have to do with um, trying to level the playing field between agribusiness 
and large firms and smaller and more sustainable firms. And by doing that, we are um, promoting an opportunity for more healthier production. I'll just give you a sampling of some of these pro-equity provisions. One is support for beginning and socially disadvantaged and veteran farmers within the Farm Bill. And that both enables these farmers to get their start and also, um, again, helps level the playing field a little bit. Contrary of origin labeling on meat was very controversial in this Farm Bill, as it has been in past ones. Um, and in fact, the meat industry was the only major agricultural group that was opposing this Farm Bill. And the idea of country of origin labeling um, is threatening because the idea is that some people might decide not to buy certain meat products if they knew that they were produced in certain places. The third thing to mention is that there was a rider that would have prevented USDA from um, addressing some anti-competitive business practices and that was defeated. At the same time, there were some provisions in the Farm Bill that pushed us in a relatively negative direction. In terms of crop insurance, as with other subsidies, there's a real concern that some farms that are making a great deal of money are getting these subsidies, and there was a provision to reduce that subsidy for farmers making over $750,000, which failed. There were also concerns because those who are supported through um, crop insurance are confidential, whereas in the past we were able to access the names of, the, of those who were receiving, receiving funds through subsidies. So finally, rural income and quality of life. And this, this is considered to be a significant purpose within the Farm Bill. And yet, these initiatives um, did not, do not receive a great deal of the Farm Bill budget. In fact, only two hundredths of a percent went to rural economy and community development, according to the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. I want to talk briefly about research because research cross cuts across all of these areas. And as I mentioned, research is key in bringing down price. It's also really important for giving us tools to advance resilience of the food system, which we desperately need, um, and to strengthen our infrastructure. And in this Farm Bill, $1.2 billion was put into the research programs, and the majority of this actually went to specialty crop research. So that was great that that money was put into research, but of course there could have been more. So let me return to the important messages here from this overview of the Farm Bill and its contents. First, regarding food security, Farm Bill's SNAP program has been one of the most important interventions we have for keeping people fed, but the benefits are generally not enough to provide a full and healthy diet. So a public health Farm Bill would expand access and benefit size and we've instead worked to cut both, though of course we can be grateful it wasn't worse. A public health farm bill would also help increase and incentivize healthy options for those using SNAP and emergency feeding programs. This farm bill has several small programs in this direction, but there's so much more to do. Regarding the farm bill's impact on what we eat, while the idea has been widely accepted that commodity programs, particularly direct payment subsidies, play a major role in driving our food choices and the obesity epidemic. The evidence does not actually support this generally. Regardless, in this farm bill, those subsidies are ended, and we've shifted towards crop insurance as our major farm safety net program. The reality remains that our farm bill overwhelmingly supports commodity production over produce. That said, the diversity and size of Farm Bill programs focused on fruits and vegetables or healthy foods and on local and regional produce has continued to grow. In the context of the Farm Bill's nearly trillion dollar budget, this is a drop in the bucket. And regardless of the evidence I just mentioned, a public health Farm Bill would drastically increase the size of this investment. Also, I want to just add to what I said before to note that farm policies that help bring down the farm price of fruits and vegetables and local and regional foods may make a clearer impact on our food choices than those that impact the cost of commodities. Because for these fresher foods, there's a much larger portion of the farm price that's reflected in what we pay for than for processed foods. And that's because we're paying far fewer middle people. So what about the environment? There was a significant win in this Farm Bill in applying conservation compliance to crop insurance. Additional investment in oversight and enforcement would be important. 
We've still got a long way to go in incentivizing more sustainable practices through the majority of our food production system. But the conservation programs we have are generally quite good, although the ongoing decision to set aside conservation funds for IFAP still defies logic from my perspective. But our conservation programs are too small. We seem to have our head in the sand about the magnitude of threats we face from climate change, biodiversity loss, water shortages and contamination, soil depletion and, and contamination, and overuse of resources like energy and phosphorus. A public health farm bill is one that takes the long view to protect our food supply and environmental health and invests in these programs not in competition with the rest of the farm bill, but in the context of the extent of what we need to change. So let's turn to equity. As I described, this farm bill has both wins and losses. There are a few positive provisions that can help level the playing field for small and mid-sized farms, new and socially disadvantaged farmers, and farmers and consumers versus agribusiness, as well as those producing uh, produce and more sustainably produced crops, and those producing for local and regional markets. But a public health bill could go much farther in terms of shifting farm bill investments to those who most need them, and in promoting additional equity in food access as well. Finally, rural income and quality of life and rural public health. So people living in rural areas are substantially impacted by the farm bill. Rural community life and livelihoods are affected by the money flowing through the primary farm bill programs, and the farm bill also has a number of programs aimed at strengthening rural communities. As in these other areas that I've described, so much more can be done. In sum, there are a few important wins for public health in this farm bill, but there's a steep gap between what we have and a true public health farm bill. Could we have gotten much more given the state of Congress? I'm skeptical but a more open process throughout might have increased receptivity to our efforts. And this is a process for the long haul. There's work to be done in the Farm Bill and in many other federal, state, and local policies to help our policy structure align with the population's best interests.